right, James. Good evening, man. Welcome back to the Ableist Manifestations podcast. How are you doing, my man? Well, man, nice to see you again. Nice to speak to you again. I'm doing very well, thank you. And thank you for wanting to, to speak with me again on here. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been really cool because uh, I think the last time uh, we spoke was around February last year, which was, I think, literally just a week before uh, Warlock's Grimm and with the Tags yeah. actually came out. And it's yeah. fucking phenomenal seeing the growth of the band since then, man. You guys have fully skyrocketed since then. Yeah, it's been a crazy year. Yeah, it's, yeah, I've been so busy and it's, yeah, it's cool to see that people enjoyed it and stuff. And yeah, it's been, yeah, you know, like, yeah, like the growth or whatever, you know, like things, you know, offers coming in and just being busy, I guess, the whole time. It's been, it's been crazy. And it's been, yeah, it's, yeah, like I say, it's been, it's been a while since we last spoke. Um, we did see each other, I think, in, was it April? I think it was. Yeah, Some, in Cardiff. That's Cardiff, right. Yeah. 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 That was cool. Yeah. It's been, yeah, it's been a crazy year, and that was yeah, it was cool catching up with you in person that time. For sure, yeah, that's the fucking show that that guy had to be uh, carried out because he was getting too violent. You guys were invoking some shit in him, I think. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, like the half of the audience just disappeared at one point, and I yeah. thought, no, no one likes us. But then they all came back in, and then afterwards they were like. Yeah, we all had to drag a guy outside because he was fighting everyone or, or he tried to fight the, the security guard or something. Uh, it did. It was fairly entertaining, man. Uh, I, I must say, as an audience member, um, I find stuff like that quite engaging, you know. And it's yeah. great to see, you know. Also, as like a fellow musician, to see the kind of shit that you invoked in people, you know, on like yeah. a Friday night or Saturday night, wherever it was, you know. Especially in a Cardiff where it's a place where you don't really often see that much of like kind of a metal presence, you know. It was yeah, pretty fucking cool, man. I mean, sweet. I mean, it's cool to get people going, but we don't want fighting, of course. We don't want people sure. actually getting hurt at the shows and stuff, and like ruining people, other people's experience and stuff of the show. Um, I guess yeah, that's we, what separates us with the as metal <laughs> bands with the hardcore bands, you know, where they just go in there and like start throwing punches and shit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I never even saw what happened. You know, like I say, I just. Uh, I remember looking up at one point and no one was in the audience and then <laughs> people came back and I was like, okay, cool. And yeah, afterwards I found out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crazy. But yeah, that was, no, a, it was a fun night. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Great night, man. Great. And, uh, you know, really just cool. You know, I mean, the energy that you guys have got on stage, it's one of them things, um, you know, a lot of times when people go and see metal bands, there's always like some degree of like a bit of a defense against what's on stage. A lot of people yeah. purposely try and stand still with their arms c crossed, you know, in their blasphemy shirts, you know, to make sure that they're not moving. But there's something about Hellripper that is just like, you can't help it, but just get moving. And I think that's a good quality about you guys. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely some, some shows where it's more difficult than others, you know, like... um sure people don't want to react or which is understandable you know like when you're a support band or like you're on it on stage like very early or you know it's not your audience you know there's all sorts of reasons and people enjoy the show in different ways and stuff mm. so it's all good but yeah we try and you know give give energy and uh try and get the crowd involved and stuff you know i'm always trying to move around the stage and head bang and of course every song being played at like 200 bpm or whatever kind of lends itself well to <laughs> yeah kind of carnage and that kind of stuff so yeah it's always fun when the audience you know gets in gets involved but yeah i know i appreciate people enjoy it in different ways and stuff so yeah it's uh, yeah it's it's what it is i guess <laughs> there's a cultural aspect to that too i mean you're right you know when you play shows in i don't know i guess germany or norway a lot of times the crowd's a little bit more static you know which uh, at first yeah. is kind of like okay you know we still enjoy what we're doing on stage and mm -hmm. then when you come off stage and talk to them they talk as if it's the best show they've ever seen it's like really that didn't feel like that a minute ago you know yeah. so it's a different ways i guess you know what i mean different ways of appreciation like you put it but um yeah i mean uh 
I guess uh, we can kind of just go into that because uh, you guys just did that massive tour with Abath, uh, which you told me about when we met up, and then you told yeah. me that it was going to be a very expensive endeavor because mm -hmm. of the uh, number of dates you guys had going on. So yeah. how did that tour go, man? I mean, it looked absolutely massive for you guys. Yeah, man. It went a million times better than I could have expected, um, which was great, you know? I mean, I kind of... It was our first big tour, our first support tour, you know, for like a a band of that size and Toxic Holocaust, of course, you know, two bands yeah. that are um have been going for so long and like are like legends in their own right, you know. Like um so I had no idea, you know, how people would react if people would know who we are and we're at, like I say, we were on some shows we were on at like six PM or something, half past six. Um but yeah, almost every night we had like, yeah. A great crowd you know um crowd surfing and moshing and everything which was great and yeah loads of people seem to enjoy it you know from the from the merch sales and the the feedback we got and from the online comments or followers and stuff you know and messages and stuff people saying they're new fans and stuff which is always good you know yeah um yeah it was great i mean and and of course i want to I would thank the guys in Abbott and the crew and Toxic Holocaust and everyone involved. Like they made it very easy for us. You know, it was it was very easy to be on the tour. You know, it was no stress, no hassle, um, other than our van broke down at one point. Um, but um yeah, it was very yeah, it was just a very easy and very welcoming tour to to be on, you know, no yeah no one was a dick <laughs> um, which that's always good yeah. yeah so i mean yeah and I, I you you never know what to expect with that as well you know um but yeah all the everyone involved was really nice and yeah we had a great time and yeah this year yeah we're just kind of carrying on with the touring and the shows and we're going out in summer we've got like festivals and stuff throughout europe every weekend basically <laughs> For the rest that's fucking the amazing man um, and we're also sharing the stage in italy as well in italy yes yeah i'm looking forward to that man yeah mm. yeah. yeah italy yeah, was really great good. um the last couple of times we've been there so yeah i'm looking forward to that as well it'll be cool to again catch up in person and and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah for sure absolutely i've heard that uh so we're for anyone who's listening we're talking about frantic fest uh it, it, which is actually in southern italy and from my understanding that's like the only festival they get down there so you get people from sicily and whatnot okay. coming across as well and i think that it's actually during the weekend of uh i think italy's like biggest national holiday where everything okay. shuts down and people just go out and drink beer and <laughs> eat food and whatnot you know so i guess it's the perfect in environment to be doing a, a show like that you know so uh, yeah i'm i'm very excited for it as well um i think that it should be good you know and will be great to see you guys in person again as well um just uh, quickly going back to that tour thing as well you know because uh i was uh, i was thinking about this is that you know it's one thing to have the opportunity to do a tour like that you know which uh, obviously with a bath you know he has a solid foundation and i think that th whatever management team or bookers or whoever he's had behind him uh, and of course the label i know he's with season of mist i think that since when was it tw 2015 or whenever it was he came out i think they've done a really really good job of uh, just pushing everything with him you know and of course he plays with tremendous musicians as well um but um uh, you know, so it's, you know, it's a big deal to get the opportunity to play yeah. with them. Yeah. Point I'm trying to make is it's one thing to get invited or asked or get the opportunity presented to you. It's another thing to do it and completely fucking own it as you're doing it <laughs> as well, you know. So, uh, you know, there's so many times like when I go to shows and, uh, you know, um, it's not me being an elitist. Well, maybe it is actually. But, uh, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you're seeing bands, you know, like I remember one time I went to see Fields of the Nephilim in, um, in London. This was in 2016. And mm. honestly, they had the worst fucking opening band I have ever seen. It was like the 40 minutes of pure torture, you know, and okay. we were by barrier. And honestly, I would have rather, you know, put a fucking 
fucking toothpick under my big toenail and kick the wall at that point, you know, <laughs> you know, it was just fucking painful, you know, so it always makes me happy, like genuinely, I feel good when I see that, uh, you know, not just friends of mine, but bands that are legitimately good getting the opportunities to do these things and then getting exposed to those crowds you know and getting them moving yeah. and you can see the i guess the receipt for it now as well you know i mean like you just said you know you guys are fucking playing weekends you know all over the place you know every yeah. like every five minutes you guys are doing a live announcement you know yeah, and uh, yeah. everything is just looking great so just congratulations man Thank very you, very man. fucking proud of you guys thank you so much man yeah i mean yeah, it's always hard to to be an opening band. Like I like like I say, you know, you're on early. Um, sometimes the you know the packages are kind of weird. So, like fans of one band just will not be a fan of you know another band on the bill. You know, just because of the styles are different or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think kind of the the package was good. You know, uh, Abbath is kind of more. He's kind of got the rock and roll kind of edge. To his bat to his music and toxic holocaust of course um who are like one of my main inspirations for hell ripper so mm. being a part of that like a package like that i think really helped kind of with a have some sort of common fan base or um mm. or the fans of those bands will you know me uh, there's more chance that they'll respond to us because because of similarities or whatever so that was you know helpful and uh yeah we just go out and go, do the best we can you know uh balls to the wall kind of do what we do and hopefully people uh react you know um i always want to give give it my all for a show you know i don't want to half-ass a show um if the audience even if the audience isn't responding or if there's not much people there, you know. If you anything, want... if the audience is not responding, that makes you kick it, ass yeah. even harder. Yeah, you want to go and yeah, just deliver the best show and hopefully yeah. convert a few people to fans and um hopefully the people that already like you, you know, enjoy the show. You know, like there's people that are there, uh, they want to see a show. Um mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean that's all you can really do. That's like go out and do do your best. So yeah, and yeah, I, like I say, we, we were fortunate that it all went well and things seemed to align. Yeah, no complaints at all from me <laughs> on that tour. Very, very happy to hear that, man. Uh, also, this coincided with, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Abath's uh, mother passed away during yeah. the end of that tour. Uh, I, I felt very sad for him when I saw that, you know, because he posted the picture and she seemed like she was a cool person and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, always a tough thing, especially when you're uh, away from home. So what was the, uh, what was the, I guess, the, the atmosphere like around that time? Um, I mean, we weren't, we were in our own van and the other bands were in a bus. So we didn't really spend mm -hmm. a lot of time you know, around, um, like, directly with the other bands other than, like, in the venue. And uh, and Abbott himself, you know, I I only spoke with him a couple times. Um, um, and, yeah, really nice guy. Like, I'm not, like, really nice. I blew out my voice at one point. I was having voice, like, troubles, and he came over and he was, like, giving me tips and stuff, and he was like, oh, you should get this medicine thing and stuff, you know. Um, cool. Uh, stuff like that. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, it was just kind of, I did. We didn't know what was gonna happen, you know. Um, understandably, like if the tour was to be cancelled or whatever, then that's understandable, you know. Um, so we, yeah, we were just kind of um, waiting to see what happened, and it was uh, his call or or whatever to what they were doing, and yeah, he like he carried on the tour, um, which was, you know, that was really like really cool of him to like carry on the tour and um other than the one date where he had to um go back to norway uh, for the funeral but yeah um it's a horrible you know situation for for him and um yeah i mean i can't really comment it, it uh you know um it's just whatever 
yeah, he was yeah, he was willing to carry on the tour and he delivered a show every night to the fans, you know, a great show. And yeah, and I think people were, you know, um, yeah, people would have understood, you know, if he cancelled or whatever, but he didn't. Mm. And yeah. Um yeah <laughs> it's a real sign of commitment i think you yeah. know uh, it's a it's a respectable thing you know i didn't mean to put you on the spot yeah. with that question either i was just yeah. genuinely curious because... yeah i mean yeah i've got no real you know insight like i say we weren't really sharing space or anything so um i could i couldn't tell you what like the the over like the yeah. atmosphere or whatever you know um yeah, but I think just a general thing, you know, like this is the thing that people sometimes forget about, you know, and it's that, uh, oh, you get to live this amazing life and then mm -hmm. you get to go on stage and do all these things, you know, and they don't really see what it's like behind the scenes, you know, and, uh, you know, to have been in their position, I can only imagine, you know, that like to have yeah. been doing it for as many years, you know, to have sacrificed so much of your life just doing rock and roll. It's, uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of burdens to that that the average person or even metalhead will not see whatsoever, mm. you know. So uh, it's a lot of weight to bear when uh, when yeah. something uh, unfortunate and tragic like that happens, yeah. you know. And, uh, and, uh, and then you've got, on one hand, the pressure of the fans and the expectations. And then on the other hand, you'd also have the pressure of the, the crew who also have to make a living. And then, yeah. you know, you've got the agents and the promoters. There's a, there's a lot of pressure yeah. there, you know. So, um, you know, I, I think kudos to him for handling yeah. it like a pro, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't know what the options were, you know. Um, but he seemed to kind of, yeah, that was it. Um, this is what's happening. This is we're carrying on the tour, and other than the the one day that it'll be gone, and yeah, but like you say, yeah, there's so much, you know, if you're on the road and stuff. I mean, I can't. I mean, we've only done like one one tour, one or two <laughs> tours, so I'm not a a road warrior that's like all like you know away all the time, but. Yeah. yeah, but also, sorry to interrupt you, but to you, that's what you have done, you know, and that makes a big impact on yeah. on you, I think. So anyway, for me, that's yeah. been the case. Yeah, but yeah, like people, I know, you know, people miss birthdays, people miss, like, um, yeah, um, people getting ill and stuff like that, you know, you're away. And ultimately, it's your job, you know, you're away doing your job and people and, and things happen back home that you have to deal with in one way from across the world you know in some mm -hmm. in some situations and yeah it's it can be tough i guess for for people um dealing yeah with. yeah absolutely that's why i think what was it metallica they always uh i think for like the last uh, 15 20 years or something if they do tours they do two weeks on two weeks off two weeks on two weeks yeah. off. it's pretty yeah. fucking wild that they can afford yeah. that <laughs> i know that'd be great i'd love yeah to do, right i'd love to do that yeah yeah, kind of just picking and choosing. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we're not at Metallica's level. Um, <laughs> not yet. Yeah, maybe one day. But yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, that that's one workaround for being away so long. And um, and yeah, that's, that's a band like Metallica who can choose. But, you know, you've got the majority of people in metal who have uh, jobs and families and kids and stuff you know that um they need to work around and you know um you can't just you can't just go away whenever you want and come back and mm -hmm. go away and stuff like that so yeah yeah maybe one day we'll get to to the metallica level just doing whatever you want <laughs> That's it, yeah. If you hire a new bass player, you can just give him a million dollars on the spot. Exactly, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they did with uh, Rob Trujillo. Rob, uh, yeah. 
in <laughs> case anyone didn't get the reference. But no, that's that's cool, man. You know, I mean, I think one thing that's uh, that's great is just you know, like we already said, just the growth that you guys have been experiencing. I think this album seemed to serve you guys really well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's a there's a weird thing that happens. You know, I definitely just experienced this with Trivex since we put out our album. When was it? Mm -hmm. September. And uh, I say when was it as if I wouldn't know. Of course, I, I know the dates. But, uh, you know, um, <laughs> the the thing um, that was interesting was that uh, the new stuff always seems to bring attention to the old stuff whenever you release yeah. it. Because you got people who just discover you for the first time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an interesting dynamic to that, you know. Because, like, for example, for me, let's make an example here. Probably, I would say my most favorite Watain record is Casus Luciferi, their second mm -hmm. record. Yeah. But the al the albums after that give value to that particular album. So if that was the only, yeah. if, if they only had released their first two albums, I would kind of be like, oh yeah, this band sounds cool. But because mm -hmm. they've released all this stuff after it, and you know, and you get to understand the characteristics yeah. and the and the weight of the band, then you get to appreciate the earlier stuff more somehow. I don't know if that's something that yeah. resonates with you. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, and you can hear like the growth and stuff, or 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 different influences and stuff. Or you can go back to a record and say, "Oh, look here, here they're starting to um um shine through with the the heavy this heavy metal like harmonies or whatever you know." Just and then you can hear that on their later albums. You know, it's it's cool like charting a band's growth, and you can see depending on the band and stuff, it can also be a product of its time as well you know um definitely for better, for better or for worse you know um um yeah and it is cool you know discovering i love discovering a band and finding out they've got like loads more material to listen to it's always so you know frustrating when you're like oh, i love this band but it's their only album or something it's like their first album you discover them um so you've just got to make do with like the the songs they have out but yeah when you discover a band and you're like, wow, they've got 10 years of material that I can go and explore. It's, And then you can kind of go, yeah, go on your own journey with the band with a different outlook as if you got in at the beginning, I guess, you know, um, I think. It's because I think that you get to understand what they were trying to do earlier on yeah. a bit better, you know, yeah. like, for example, if you discover Bathory through Blood, Fire, Death, and then you go and listen to, let's say, the first two albums, then you perhaps have more of an appreciation for those. Whereas if you hear them as the first impression, maybe you might not quite get it as much. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and yeah, sometimes sometimes it can put you off as well. So, you know, say you discover, you know, a record that you don't like. Mm. And then you're like, I'm never, I'm never going to listen to this band. But you're missing, but you haven't listened to the first couple of albums that were like, you know, proper great, you know. Um, I wonder like, how many new fans Six Feet Under are getting right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, the, their old stuff is great. Sure. Their old stuff is great. Um, but yeah, um, I'm not a big fan of the new stuff. Uh, Sorry to say. I'd be surprised if anyone is. I, yeah. you know, I'm not throwing shade. This is just a purely analytical perspective, you know. But yeah. I've never known someone complimented. I never have. Maybe there are people. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, yeah, I do like uh, like kind of ch uh, charting a band's journey, be it from the beginning or starting at the end and working your way back. You know, it's. I think it can give you a it gives you a different perspective each time. Um, I think, yeah, you know, some people will start at the beginning, and then as they as you release more albums or whatever, they're like, oh, I like I like the earlier stuff better. The new stuff is too, whatever. You know, I like the de the first demo was the best, but if you get in later, you kind of don't have that excuse. You're you're not you're not biased that way. You're not like, um, oh, I grew up with the first demo and. I'm I'm not listening to this. It's too melodic or whatever. If you get in at the melodic bit, you don't have the the prior experience or prior biases you have. I don't know if I make if uh yeah I don't know if I'm making myself uh, 
clear there. I've got something I want to say, but it's try to get out. <laughs> this is why we play music, man. It's a lot yeah. easier to communicate that way. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. It's, uh... But I, I understand what you're trying to say. You know, I think there's I, sometimes as well, there's just some kind of uh, cultural aspect to it where you always say, you know, I mean, you got to remember, you know, people thought Metallica sold, sold out when they released Ride the Lightning. Yeah. You know, so oh, yeah. arguably, maybe their best record, you know, and uh, at least in a lot of people's eyes, I am kind of torn, but it's way up there, you know, and yeah. I think that, you know, there's there's just something to that whole oh first album thing you know because i think that other than the fact that in many cases i gotta say it is actually true whether it's the case of i don't know deicide morbid angel or whatever there's the countless examples that mm -hmm. oh yeah the first album is always the best but yeah. also at the same time i think that um one thing that is also the case is that there's just this um metal heads um sort of i guess one of their downfalls which also happens to be one of their qualities is the fact that they're very possessive over the bands that they like yeah. so when it comes to that earlier stuff it almost feels like the band is somehow more accessible not yeah. musically but communally you yeah. understand what i'm saying so it almost feels like oh yeah these guys are just one of us you know we're we're one of them but then when the band gets big then it's like oh i only liked them before they had 500 likes on facebook kind yeah. of thing you know Absolutely. what i mean you know yeah yeah i totally get it yeah and i yeah i know people like that and i see people like that on the, online all the time and yeah i'm i was actually speaking with my girlfriend about this like one or two days ago it's like if you if you like a band what why why wouldn't you want them to succeed you know exactly like i want i want yeah. i like them but i want them to stay underground and and not make a living and not not sell any albums you know like it makes no sense i would want them to be succeed and then keep being able to produce music or do what they do or whatever um it's yeah, a... and you want them to be able to, you know, and again, it's not to just completely give them a free pass, you know, so even if they start, you know, basically making shit music, still mm. support them the same way, but you you do, of course, want them to do better so they can carry on doing that, you know, because I think that, or at least for me personally, I have this attitude of, I like to see artists who I appreciate really be able to get the rewards or yeah. reap the rewards of all of the hard work and effort that they're putting into what they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess, uh, like you or I like being involved in bands and being in bands and being in, in this industry, whatever you kind of know, you know what the bands are going through, you know, the, the, their experiences, their, uh, like all the, the shit sides and all the hard work you need to do um it's not fucking but, easy but i do love it <laughs> yeah oh yeah i love it but yeah, yeah. it's it, yeah it's not easy like you say yeah. yeah and yeah getting to like a huge level you know there's a lot of shit that comes with that you know and um like work and um logistics and all that kind of stuff and things you have to do and whatever um so it is difficult and yeah it, it it's yeah i i just want if i'm a fan of a band i want them to to do well you know if yeah if someone comes up to me and says oh have you heard this band i'm like oh yeah someone someone else like they're breaking through someone else knows them like um it, it can only be a good thing i guess it's the same with how people don't want you know like metal like master of puppets being in like stranger things and stuff and people are annoyed that people are hearing metallica or whatever i thought, I thought that was an amazing thing what yeah. a great thing to happen for our genre exactly if it if if it turns one person on to metal you know then they might have a genuine interest in it. there's a chance that they may just like the one song or they may like the you know or might just say they like it or whatever but there are people that will get into metal or into music or whatever via via that song and then we'll just yeah look into it further we'll discover smaller underground bands get involved in the scene maybe make their own music um yeah to me it's not it, it it's not a bad thing at all it can only it if 
if it helps the scene at large, it that will help you. You know, the more successful, like, the more people that are interested in a style of music, then the more people theoretically should be could be interested in your own band or whatever. Um, yeah, I I see no benefits to kind of the gatekeeping or um, that kind of thing. Yeah, because I think it's necessary for the survival of the genre anyway. I am also, you know, I'm kind of like a bit of a on the fence kind of a position on this in the sense that I 100% believe in preserving the uh, standards and the traditions of a genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But equally, I'm also uh, a big proponent of uh, new people discovering the genre through whatever means necessary. You know, I mean, I'll be the first to admit that uh, I've talked about this on the podcast before. I think when I had uh, Kyle from Vitriol on the first time around, uh, but the first uh, sort of real exposure I had to metal was uh, from watching Undertaker's entrance at WrestleMania 19 because oh, yeah. he had Limbiscuit performing yeah. for him. Yeah, you know? I think I think things like wrestling, like when I was in, into wrestling, like during the Attitude Era, there was a lot of like the new metal and the alternative rock and stuff was used in promos and um, all that kind of thing. I think Marlon Manson was one of the was like the theme tune for SmackDown or something like that or Raw. I can't remember. Well, like, you had Motorhead doing the game. And Motorhead, yeah, of course, doing... Yeah, they've done multiple. They've done two or three Triple H songs. and That's right, yeah. I think they did Evolution and Evolution King of and Kings, King so there was King. like three of them. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and then, yeah, I mean, even Typo Negative. Uh, well, they they submitted a track, I think, but it didn't get used, but... It was meant to be for Kane, wasn't it, it in like 2003 Kane, or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, you've got all that kind of stuff. And yeah, things like wrestling. And I mean, yeah, thing like these mainstream things like the, uh, again, this was something I just watched a documentary yesterday on uh, the Tony Hawk games. And the, sure. sound, and the soundtrack to like, you know, just games in general. Um, um, yeah, Tony Hawk had all these like punk and metal and like rap, like rap stuff. And um for me as well, like, you know, I'm a football fan, so I would play the FIFA games and there was stuff on there like um, the f um, first couple of like Kings of Leon and stuff like that, you know, indie mm. rock at the time. Um, a Need for Speed Most Wanted. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, I do. Yeah, I had that. <laughs> the, one I the one I remember from one of the Need for Speeds was uh, the Riders on the Storm Snoop Dogg remix. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of them. Yeah. See, you and you can discover, even then, yeah. See, that's a a Snoop Dogg song, but then you, you can discover the Doors from that if you're, you know, yeah. interested in that. Uh, go through that kind of stuff. So, I mean, yeah. the remix. I don't know if for anyone who's heard it, I I remember thinking it was quite funny because uh, I was quite young when that when that came out. Anyway, you know, I guess you and I were both more or less the same age, but. Yeah. It was uh, it was quite funny because uh, I remember kind of revisiting that and listening to the song. And obviously, I know Riders of the Storm very well. But then you listen to Snoop Dogg's bits, you know, and he's like, yeah, Need for Speed. It's like, yeah. this has nothing to do with the original <laughs> song. But it still sounds cool, I guess, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah, there's so much ways people get into metal, you know, just uh, not the... Um, the old school tape trader ways now you know mm. because we've got the internet and media sh uh sharing metal um i mean even now i think like uh i think code orange are are involved with wwe doing theme tunes oh that's something. cool something like that i'm not too sure but yeah um yeah if you, if you can get into metal anyway in, mm. in any way you know not everyone has the same experiences uh to you know, not everyone's part of a big scene with local bands that are playing black metal and stuff like that. And yeah, so not everyone can get into it as in a true cult way or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, but I think it's the, it, it will find the right people, you know, and that's what matters. You know, like mm -hmm. I said, you know, you might start with Limp Bizkit, you might start with Nirvana, you might start with whatever what matters is ultimately where you find yourself you know and whether you do have a genuine appreciation uh, yeah. for uh, you know because the thing is as well that 
I think that um, actually Eric from Watain kind of alluded to this on the podcast a few episodes ago. And he made a really good point that we don't really have our shit together as a culture when it does come to uh, preserving the traditions and whatnot uh, and also passing on the information that's sort of been accumulated over time. Uh, now, I do, of course, I understand that perhaps part of that might slightly go against this whole thing of just welcome everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that what's more important is sort of preserving what really matters, you know, and... Uh, you know, and, and I guess what you can sort of uh, appreciate about that is that if you're someone who is into black metal, you must go and at least listen to or discover new wave of British heavy metal. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. if you're someone who discovered this through new metal, that's fine. But you need to go back and sort of discover all of these traditions and the forefathers that kind of came before it. And I think maybe that's m- more of what he kind of meant by that, mm-hmm. you know, which if it is the case, that's what I think as well. You know, it's that it doesn't matter how you get introduced to it, but you should always take the time to go back and listen to what happened. Like, for example, if someone says to me that, yeah, I'm a metalhead, but then they listen to Trivium and Machine Head and have never heard of Black Sabbath and Priest, I mm. kind of don't consider them a metalhead mm. because it's like yeah. you're really missing the bigger picture here. Like, you've not paid your membership fee yet, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And yeah, I, I mean, that could be the same, I guess. You know, I'm a fan of some bands and other genres and stuff, but I wouldn't consider myself, you know, like a, like a, a rap a rap fan, like a, or whatever, you know. Um, a rapist? Be, <laughs> definitely <laughs> would not consider myself that. That's um, good. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I like some some of the music. I'm a big fan of some of it, but I wouldn't but i wouldn't have the knowledge and um of like some stuff um not a connoisseur of that yeah, other particular genre exactly yeah. yeah it's like i've got a kind of interest in some songs they appeal to me but yeah i'm not like a you know like i'm a metal head i know i i research the metal i listen to metal i try and find new bands and all that kind of stuff i'm not the same and most other genres so i wouldn't consider myself a whatever whatever the fans call themselves like hip-hop heads or electro heads or whatever i don't know what yeah call yeah (laughs) yeah no I, i understand what you're saying you know and i think it's that's perfectly fine you know i mean one of my favorite bands of all time uh i guess the swedish listeners here might go into cardiac arrest when i say this but one of my favorite bands of all time is the band kent you know they're like a swedish sort of pop rock band you know okay. they're like the perfect wedding band and honestly their albums you should check them out man you know okay. uh, i think musically that? kent so just like the area of uk kent okay, yeah. you know or like cool. the kent cigarettes yeah. um yeah, so for their albums from like uh, 1997, I think it's Isola is the correct pronunciation, that all the way to like Vapens and Ammunition in 2002, those three albums, man, are fucking golden. Like the songwriting is okay. so good on those, you know, they're yeah. really records that it's obviously all very kind of like, um, you know, clean singing, extremely melodic, but it's just... It's just fantastic songwriting. Like yeah. some other couple of their songs, like Kevlar Soul or uh, Kevlar Khal, I guess it's the Swedish pronunciation of it, or uh, Music Nonstop uh, from the Hagnesta Hill are like perfect. Like production, performance, composition. Like if you want to get inspiration that's not metal, listen to those Kent albums and they are absolutely phenomenal. I, I couldn't recommend them anymore. I will. Yeah. I mean, that's. You've sold it to me. I sure. Songwriting and yeah, I'm, I'll check them out tomorrow. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and again, you know, Depeche Mode, the huge, huge Depeche Mode fan. I just saw them in Birmingham, actually, man. Have oh, you ever man. seen them live? I've never seen them live. No, no. Man, they're good. They're good. Yeah. I've seen videos <laughs> on YouTube and stuff. That's about as close as I've got. But yeah, yeah, they look great. Yeah. 
Yeah, my friend uh, Armando, he said to me that uh, Dave Gaunt's kind of like Freddie Mercury level of crowd control when he plays live. Oh. You know what? He, he's not far off. Like if you see him in person, yeah. you know, when when he gets the crowd going on some of the some of the classic hits, you know, yeah. they got all these. One thing I always loved is when bands kind of incorporate crowd interactions into the set, like you're yeah. supposed to incorporate. I always kind of try to redo it with Trivex within the context of Extreme Metal. Yeah. Um, I just think it's the best thing ever, you know. Uh, Hetfield did it with, I don't know if you saw this, but when they were doing the Black Album anniversaries in 2012, they did this bit on uh, My Friend of Misery where he got the whole crowd to yeah. sing a harmony did you the see those football, yeah yeah he's i think he's done that a few times maybe maybe it was that video i saw but yeah i've seen that yeah yeah it's like that's like yeah. a fucking religious experience you've got yeah. like 50 60 000 people he got one half to sing one melody and he got the other yeah. half to sing another melody and then they were doing harmony it's like fuck man that is so powerful you know like yeah we just yeah we may as well summon aliens with that kind of power yeah i've seen yeah. a few people do that like um accept did it uh or do it with uh yeah uh, princess of the dawn that's um, it that's it and of course dio with um heaven and hell i've seen him do that a few times um yeah yeah it's really cool um yeah i don't it's it's difficult to kind of do that in in speed metal i think uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying, you know, when I said when we do it with Trivex, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, it's kind of like you can do it within the context of getting people chanting. And that's a yeah. great thing when you yeah. do that, because it almost like always works as well for us. At least it never feels like we've struggled with it. The, the crowd always, for yeah. whatever reason, they respond, you know, and they chant along really fucking loud. But um yeah, yeah, you know, because that's a, that's a big fear, you know, is if you get them going and then they don't respond, <laughs> then, oh, yeah. and then you look like a dick, you know. But thankfully, that's never been the case. Have you guys ever considered doing anything like that, or maybe for you, it's more like pit oriented? If you um, plant anything in the set, um, we kind of have a few bits where we kind of um try and get like a chant going. Um, you know, there's a mm. few like slower slower parts that kind of lend themselves well to it like kind of slow head bangy like the the start of the song affair of the poisons that's kind of hmm. mid great song kind of thing um but yeah i mean most of our set is kind of like yeah 200 bpm d beats and blast beats so it's uh quite difficult but there is a um we played a show i think it was uh somewhere in sweden i can't remember which city it was but it was sweden a couple of years ago and there was one point where I was like, um, right, let's get a pit going. And the audience literally just shouted back, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, fair. I respect that, you know? It, yeah. Uh, what yeah. do you say to that? Uh, fair enough, I mean, you know? Yeah. I, I, what can you say to that? I was like, oh, well, <laughs> fair enough, you know? Um, <laughs> That's such a Scandinavian response. That's really funny. Yeah, yeah I thought it was great. It was fucking hilarious. <laughs> it's like, we don't like to get into each other's space. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's awesome. You know, well, you know, it's kind of one of them things, you know, I guess it, it don't stop the enjoyment or, or whatnot. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's good. And also, you know, just to pick on what you just said as well, what a, what a luxury not to know which city you were playing in, right? <laughs> no, no, I know which cities we played in, but I can't remember which one it was. All right, I see. That happened. I see. Um, I was gonna say it's like oh yeah we did this gig in this foreign country I have no idea yeah. which city no. it was yeah no yeah no I think <laughs> I think it was Stockholm I think it was that one mm -hmm. you know um yeah I just remember it definitely being in Sweden but yeah when when you're on you know when you're playing on tour and stuff for so long well for me anyway um I'm horrible at paying attention at the best of times and so like you know you loads of shows kind of uh blur into one if you know what i mean you know it's difficult sure yeah to, yeah to pick out um some things you know uh, i just remember it being in sweden i think it was stockholm i'm sure it was stockholm but yeah that was funny i mean that was a great show it was a great show um they were just uh i think i think they did get going at one point anyway i think it was just uh maybe too early in the in the set for them they we hadn't proven ourselves yet or something i don't know <laughs> but yeah yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> no, that's killer, man. That's killer, you know. And again, l- let's just like kind of strip it down. You know, what a cool opportunity just, you know, get asked to go to different fucking countries to play music. Yeah, right? Like, I get that. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of bands that do it. You know, oh, it's this thing, you know. And I, I always say one of my favorite quotes of all time is comparison is the thief of joy, you know. Mm. And I think that probably a lot of musicians at least that i know in the uk are definitely guilty of this you know mm. uh, it's one thing to like be competitive and then feel uh, you know feel like oh i want to do that i want to do that that's great but then you know you still got to value and appreciate what it is that you've got in front of you and what you've earned yourself mm. so far you know and i think that uh you know, as a musician and when you're surrounded by the, as you put it, the industry side mm-hmm. of it, sometimes it's easy to get cynical and be like, oh, yes, but all these other bands, they're playing there. They're playing South America. Oh, did you see that band? They're playing Japan. Oh, we've never been there. And then it's kind of like, that's fine, but why not just be, you know, be, you know, hopefully you'll get to do those, but yeah. just be content that you're actually getting to do these shows. You know, first of all, think... you've got the freedom to do it. You've got the cultural freedom. Then you've got a following that you can actually perform for mm-hmm. and, uh, and that you are getting asked to do gigs, you know, and, um, you know, and I, I always say to my friends, you know, and I kind of have internal conversations with myself also, where mm-hmm. I say, you know, like the fact that you're getting to fly to this country, the fact that they're paying you to go across to europe to the country you've never been to before just to do fucking metal for like 45 minutes it's the coolest fucking thing in the world right i know it's crazy yeah i yeah every so often i kind of like just like look at like the upcoming shows or something i'm like this is crazy that this is happening like (laughs) yeah that yeah like that you just said that we're getting paid to go and scream about goats you know, over <laughs> yeah. Europe or whatever, you know, it's, it's amazing. And yeah, I'm, mm. I, I don't take any of it for granted. I'm very appreciative of the, that people are interested enough to want us to come over there and want to pay to see us and stuff. I mean, that's, yeah, it's crazy to me. It's, it's so cool. And yeah, I count myself very lucky and that I'm able to do it and that, yeah it's yeah, it's just crazy you know i stop and think about it every every so often you know it's just so weird you know like for example you know you like you'll you'll be asked to play a festival or something or a show um and you look at the lineup and you're like wow i'm playing with this band you know one of my favorite bands or whatever this is so this is ridiculous <laughs> Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing, man, you know. And uh like I said, I, I think I think it's great to see you guys kind of getting that as well, you know, especially I think since like, you know, not to kind of like sort of go too much into that side of things. Like maybe it's not as relevant, but just even seeing lineup positioning, you know, uh I yeah. see some announcements sometimes. I'm like, "Oh, cool, you're doing that," you know, and then yeah, I it's... see what other bands are beneath you. And I, but then that's that's fucking great, you know. It's cool, you know. It's not it's not a dick measuring competition, you know, but I yeah. think it's, it's it's great to see that that you're kind of getting that. Actually, just on that as well, if I may put the spotlight on you a bit further here. Um how do you managed to stay grounded considering that you started where from Aberdeen as like a kind of like a solo project you know completely DIY completely underground and now you've kind of like you know you've got this wildfire spreading you know and uh, you've just kind of built everything from scratch you know and of course you do have a great band by you you know and I know that uh, your girlfriend also helps out helps you out a lot as well but how do you stay grounded as this fan base keeps Keeps on growing and you keep getting more of this kind of wave uh, of appreciation coming your way um i i, I don't really I, I don't know i just kind of to me the music is what's important i don't really you know i never got into music to to be big or to have fans or anything you know it's uh mm-hmm. i started the band with the, the expectation that 10 people in my local scene might might hear the ep and that was it. That was like the goal for Hellripper. And it just kind of gradually grew. Um, and I suppose being a one man band and I live up in the Highlands, I don't really have much contact with anyone, you know, um, like I don't really see people in real life. You know, I 
to speak with people online and stuff. So I don't really have like a a scene and stuff like it to to like you know I'm not surrounded by people that kind of treat you differently and stuff. I'm kind of everything is the same as it was back when I started Hell Ripper. You know everything is done DIY in in a room in my house and on a laptop. Ninety percent the same equipment. Um, I'm the only one doing the social media, the emails, the the merch, other than the other merch stores, but like the main merch store is me. Um yeah, I don't know. It's it's not difficult for me not to be a, a dickhead. I don't know. Um maybe people will think I am a dickhead, I don't know. But uh I No, you've always been very this is the thing I, I absolutely commend about you, man, you know, and I think it's the thing that kind of like gets rid of that defense when it comes to enjoying the music of yeah. El Ripper is that you've always presented yourself in such a grounded way you know i've never yeah. heard you say something stupid publicly i wish i could say the same about myself <laughs> and uh <laughs> you know and and yeah you know you always have like a very leveled approach uh what do you think that's credit to you know i mean uh, i guess like you said it's down to the music but just for yourself personally i mean yeah, where does that come from because that's not something that everyone possesses so was this something that maybe was passed down from parents parents or maybe. what yeah. is it yeah maybe yeah i mean i've got no idea but it's like it's like you say i i'm i'm a fan of metal and music first so i think it's really cool that i'm able to kind of you know have a community around hell ripper where people you know like speak with each other like you know just because they're a fan of the band like and i get to speak with other metal fans you know if mm. if someone's a fan of hell ripper they've probably got similar interests to me you know so i think it's cool like i'm able to like facilitate a community of like-minded people by being hell ripper by doing hell ripper music and you know i recommend bands to people and they recommend bands to me and I ask for their advice and I don't know I just know that you know if if it's if it wasn't for people supporting the band you wouldn't be anything you know so the people that buy merch or share the music just listen to the music or post on Facebook you know um they're the ones that allow me to do this and I'm very grateful that I'm able to do this and it's like like we just said it's crazy it's amazing that I have this opportunity to play shows and have people listen to my music and go to um, Europe and other countries and stuff and play my music that I've written. Um, I, I don't know where the attitude comes from. I guess I, I was part of a kind of punk scene in Aberdeen when I first got into the local mm -hmm. scene. It was a punk punk uh yeah punk dominated scene i guess um in the the I, I, maybe the people i surround myself with i don't know um i've got i've got no idea i don't really think about it i just mm. <laughs> it's just uh yeah i just kind of like music i like being able to speak with like minded individuals about music and yeah <laughs> I've got no idea, man, but it's, yeah, I count myself very lucky and I'm very grateful that I can do any of this and speak mm -hmm. with like yourself, like being invited onto something like this where people are interested in what I have to say, even though mm -hmm. I've got nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great chat, man. It's always a blast to have you on. Uh, I think that, you know, maybe perhaps that kind of like answers itself because, uh, you know, and I appreciate you uh, kind of working with me here, you know, because Iblis Manifestations episodes are like therapy sessions for musicians, you know, yeah. so, uh, you know, there's, there's that kind of an angle to it. But I think that perhaps simply just having an outlet that uh, that is so like so close to home for you and then just being able to dedicate your time to that you know mm -hmm. it kind of like you know it's kind of like well nothing could go wrong then 
You know what I mean? You know, if you can yeah. just do that, then, you know, it's it's fine, you know. And, uh, and yeah, and I guess, well, the more important question would be how important is it for you and not just you but also the rest of your band to actually enjoy what you guys are playing um i mean i couldn't speak for the rest of the guys i assume they have a, an enjoyment of the music you know they could lie to me um, fingers crossed yeah um yeah for me it's really important that i enjoy the music like i say that's what i love doing so if i'm doing something unnatural or um or for any other reason than i want to write this song <laughs> in this style or whatever then it would be difficult for me um to keep doing it uh, i think people would see it as well you know i think mm. people would um it wouldn't be as good it would probably be like a watered down version of what it was supposed to be um but yeah, for me, the enjoyment is everything. And luckily, I enjoy it. You know, it's my main hobby. It's not a it's not a chore for me to write music or whatever. It's uh, it's what I would do anyway without any fan base or any anything. You know, I would I've always liked writing music since I was young and could first play guitar. I was trying to write my own stuff um so yeah the enjoyment for it is really is the most important part for me um mm. i guess it's different it's different i mean a lot of people have you know they write music or they record music as a kind of like outlet or a kind of catharsis or something you know to get whatever they're thinking you know out in some way um for me you know and ba just based on like the style and i guess the way i am music is fun for me that's the main thing you know i um i'm when i'm writing or something maybe maybe i am like getting something out there or it's so it's cathartic in some way but for me it's it's all about fun i want to have a good time mm. um i just yeah it, like i said it's it's a way i enjoy myself just by playing guitar and and writing stuff um yeah yeah. That's very positive, man. And positive is, uh, you know, I use that word in a in a positive way. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, yeah, that's fantastic, you know. And I guess that, uh, you know, like you said, that kind of catharsis, catharsisism, I think, that just kind of uh, becoming its own outlet and then knowing that there's an audience for it and everything, you know, it just kind of like the reward is in the work itself rather mm. than doing it to sort of yeah. like gain something external. Um, but having said that, I do have to ask you, because this is something that I've kind of gone through and I recognized this within myself as a composer, you know, because uh, probably maybe similar to yourself, I always considered myself a songwriter before a performer or before yeah. even like a guitar player or anything. I'm a songwriter first and foremost. And yeah. one thing that I kind of noticed in my own kind of train of thought, you know, was that when I realized that, oh, actually, there is an audience, that there are people who give a shit about Trivex, that there are people who want to hear what we've got to put out there, somehow that motivated me to write better music. I don't know yeah. if this is something you relate to at all. I think so. Um, I do. I think I do put kind of a, a higher standard on myself now, I think, you know, knowing that there's more people there, which I think is a good thing. Maybe pe I guess there's one way you could look at it saying it's negative because you might second guess yourself or or it's not like, you know, coming coming out fully like natural in, in one or whatever. But to me, it kind of a lot of stuff that I probably would have released previously you know i i wouldn't i write it and i wouldn't release it now you know i've got loads of riffs that i i, I would say like don't hold up to my standards um mm. which you know I, I in and it's the music is for me most of all as well because like i've got a few songs where people have said 
it it's I had a song on the first album. I showed it to a friend and he said it was his favorite song on the first album. But I didn't like it. So I just it's somewhere is deleted now. You know, I just I didn't like wow. it. Um, and I guess, yeah, it's just it's got to please me most of all, because mm. and, and I guess I don't know, it's really difficult because just through writing songs for the past 10 years and releasing them, loads of songs that I think are going to be like the fan favorites or whatever is the ones that they like the least and the ones that I think are like won't get much attention are the ones that the fans like the most. Um, mm, that's always it, a weird one. I remember Lemmy yeah. saying that before. Yeah. It's like you can never tell which one's going to kick off. Exactly. So it's really... So I think as well, just by kind of going through that, I've kind of that helps me write more for myself because I'm like, I'm gonna write if I write a song for the audience, they'll probably think it's shit, and then I don't like it, and then they don't like it. No one yes. likes it. Um, yeah, 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 one hundred percent. You so, can't. That's exactly the thing that you want to avoid when it comes to creating art. You know, is that uh, you don't want to do it for the sake of the satisfaction of yeah. other people. And first and foremost, you gotta satisfy yourself. The thing that I was talking about when I said that knowing that there's an audience makes me want to do better. It's mm -hmm. almost like having a certain degree of, I guess it's kind of a little bit like what I do as a fitness coach, mm -hmm. where it's the fact that because people have to come and respond to me, because I do weekly check-ins with all of my clients, and then we go through all the details of everything that they've done, whether it's with their workouts, whether it's with their nutrition and everything, um, that invokes a degree of accountability and yeah. i think that's more the dynamic i speak of when i say that as a songwriter um i guess i feel more accountability when i create something you know so rather than just make something uh, for the sake of it i make what i make i make it as best as i possibly can to hold up a standard knowing that, uh, you know, I guess it's still like a metaphorical thing. It's not, I'm not writing for a specific person as such, but it's the idea that every note actually counts rather than approaching it like this kind of nihilistic way of, oh, it yeah. don't matter. I'll just write it, whatever. Fuck it. You know what I mean? That there's a standard yeah. to maintain. And I think that's a very healthy thing, but it does get more difficult as you go along as well. Cause it's like, Absolutely. oh, you already done that. You know what I yeah. mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that was uh, writing the last album, The Warlocks. I wrote about, I can't remember, maybe two, three, four songs. And they were kind of, I wanted to kind of go in a more straightforward punk direction originally, like kind of, you know. Oh, like, interesting. Uh, like more, not like punk, but more punk influence, you know, closer to the early Hellripper stuff. And Mental I wrote Militia. A, yeah. <laughs> and I wrote a couple of songs. And yeah, I thought these are awful. Um, they, they, I was like, these are like the earlier stuff, but just nowhere near as good. Like, well, to me, and it felt like, yeah, it just felt like kind of rehashed versions of the the stuff that I'd already done, but just not as good. And I was like, nah, I'm I'm gonna scrap everything and start again, and kind of had a different outlook. I I kind of that's when I kind of looked and kind of brought every all the other influences in to kind of um enhance the album you know the songs have a bit more atmosphere a bit more some more slow parts a bit more uh different things with the production and stuff like that a bit more experimentation within like the limits of hell ripper i guess um but with the title song you very much as i said to you already yeah. you went in like a king diamond kind of a direction which i thought was pretty fucking cool yeah that was um I'm trying to remember writing that yeah, it was very inspired by kind of justice and black album metallica and mm -hmm. bands like bathory and uh king diamond um iron maiden with some of the guitar um um harmonies and like the bagpipe part and stuff kind of a bit dancey kind of a like dance of death kind of influenced but yeah just uh like you say there with like your favorite uh, one of your favorite bands being kent like just because it's good songwriting you can get inspiration there and 
not necessarily you might not necessarily hear it in the music you know like you might not put a, a pop riff in a trifax mm. song um but in not terms yet of, yeah <laughs> but in terms of like structure or a production idea you know just anything can jump out at you then ignite like a chain of good ideas you know like listening to a song and you're like oh wow the vocals are panned a certain way you can get that idea and run with it and do something in your content in the context of your your own music um yeah i mean that kind of inspiration is everywhere man you know yeah. like you could get your inspiration from anything it could be from film you know it could even yeah. be you know like it, one thing that uh, I did, you know, uh, and I still do, is that I like to kind of take inspiration from everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I uh, one song in particular on our very first record, not many people have even heard it, you know, although I still think it's a good song. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, I think it's the eighth song on the record. And that one, I actually based the main melody off of a melody from the old Grinch PC game and really? uh yeah and it's i mean it sounds very malevolent when you especially yeah. do it as like electric guitars you know with the rhythm and the lead yeah. um it sounds really fucking evil um yeah. but you know it's like <laughs> no one would have ever guessed oh yeah this is from the grinch the exactly. grinch <laughs> yeah. you know like video game <laughs> exactly yeah you put your own yeah. spin on it and you do it in your context and yeah i mean i think i i, I guarantee you a million different songs have been done that way taken yeah. from the coolest uh like places you know um oh actually you mentioned that just earlier tonight me and my girlfriend were listening to uh niles unas the slayer of gods in the hmm. car and then i was saying to her i was like do you know that this is actually a candle mass song um what was it it's the well of souls have you listened to those okay. two next to each other i haven't listened to them next to each other um, oh it's it's uh i will it's yeah, it's like a. I don't think it's a rip off. I think it's like a legitimate nod to yeah. Candlemas, which is great. Yeah. You know, so Una yeah. Slayer of Gods is on Niles' 2002 record uh, in their darkest in their darkened shrines. You know, and then you got Candlemas. I think it's the Well of Souls, and it's like you know, and then it's yeah. uh, it's it's just so fucking metal, man. I love yeah. it. But uh, yeah, it's great. You know, that kind of inspiration is everywhere. You know, like half of yeah. Dark Throne's discography is just a match of Celtic Frost and Motorhead. You know? Yeah, I was just going to say that. And I mean, Fenris yeah. will be the first one to, to mention that. Um, that this, <laughs> if you've heard like the commentaries and stuff, it's basically just him saying, oh, this is a, when we were trying to be Bathory. This is when we were trying to yes. do Celtic Frost. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, everyone gets inspiration from somewhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're just sharing riffs, as Dimebag said. It's one of my favorite sayings, you know. And I'm not even the biggest Pantera fan in the world, but it the idea that we're just sharing riffs, I think, is perfect, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if anything can kind of inspire you, it... <laughs> mm. I mean, I don't see any problem in that. Like, getting an idea from the Grinch or whatever. Like, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I bet there's people listening to this now thinking, "Fucking hell, I, I want to go listen to this song now." You know, like, what what the hell is this? What what the hell is Cheyenne talking about here? That's all your. <laughs> that's all the YouTube comments now. Oh, part yeah. one sounds like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Well, I, I welcome it. You know, they, at least they checked it out. Um, yeah. One thing that you know, this I've been having this a lot recently without going into too much detail because it's still private work but one thing that you know when a song is fucking good is when you go through your day-to-day -day life and i wonder if you're like this as well but you're just doing something normal and then that riff pops back in your head it's like oh yeah there it is you know yeah. and then going through that over and over like you're going through your day-to-day -day life doing just chores doing, doing dishes or walking to the gym whatever and then that riff comes into your head and you're not listening to anything but you can hear it and it's like oh there it is yeah you know yeah and yeah when it's your own stuff i'm always wary because i'm like either it's a really good riff or a really cool bit or i've just heard this thing a million times that it's stuck <laughs> and i'm like i don't know if it's catchy or not or if it's just because it's ingrained in me so i've mm -hmm. always got to kind of try and leave leave it aside or or ask someone else i'm like is this good or is this you know 
after working on something for so long, um, you know, because most of my riffs I have for so long, like I, I take ages to work on albums and stuff because I do it I kind feel of, that. I do it like bit by bit and stuff. And so if I've had like a riff for 10 years or something, I'm like, is this a good riff or is it just because I've literally heard it a thousand, two thousand times? <laughs> mm. yeah. Yeah, but well, I think I'm a little bit more arrogant in that way. Where if that happens, I just know it's because it's good. But yeah, <laughs> that's that's Fair me. Enough. Yeah, you're more <laughs> self assured than I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. You know, but I guess you know it's down to you know ultimately you being the one who enjoys it. But you know yeah. what? That fucking I, that's so relatable. What you're saying about being slow with albums and fucking music, you know it's um that one that's a really painful one you know like i wish it sometimes i wish it was easier to release albums you know yeah. um but i guess that would devalue the releasing of albums yeah. but sometimes i'm just like come on man you know does it have to be every like three years or however yeah. long it's been for us i mean you think of uh you know i mean we are not the only examples of this one that always really impressed me was you know with dissection um Apparently, Night's Blood, which of course, you know, um, opening track of um, uh, Storm of the Light Spain, well, second track technically, that apparently already existed during the era of uh, Somberlane. Like, even okay. I think maybe even before Somberlane was recorded. Okay, yeah. But then somehow, it, because it sounds so much better than, the, it's more complex than the stuff yeah. that's on Somberlane, but apparently he kind of uh, just saved it for the second album maybe he knew because it was better but uh, yeah. that's always you know there's always like stuff like that you know that I guess bands and artists do you know that you kind of have to um, do a bit of um, foreshadowing I guess I don't know yeah. I don't know but I, I thought that was very impressive you know that that song already existed like two three years prior to that yeah. album coming out yeah I have seen a few bands where like you check out their first demo or whatever and they've got like five songs on there and four of them are re-recorded for the first album and then the mm. the last one ends up being on the second third fourth album you know yeah um, yeah for me i for me i i do that like i have like two or three songs that were supposed to be on the last album but i just wasn't happy with a couple of parts and i couldn't come up with the parts to kind of finish them i didn't have like the inspiration and so I've kept them aside and I will work on the the parts that I'm not happy with and they will probably be released at some point, you know. Um Yeah. Do you I, ever visualize playing a song live when making it? No. Um otherwise the guitar parts would be a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's some Sure, there's yeah, some, that makes sense. I mean, the early stuff it was like really easy. I mean, it's mostly just kind of like there's like three riffs per song, they're like two minutes. Mm. Um, but yeah, especially with the last album and the new stuff I'm working on, I'm like, some of the riffs are just, especially while singing at the same time, that's, that's the, the main problem for me, the, the singing and the playing. Um, but I don't think about it because then that would affect my thinking for the actual writing or recording of the song. You know, I'd be like thinking, oh, I need to play this live. I'm going to simplify this riff, but that might you know, hinder the riffs quality or whatever. Mm. Um and I want a good a good song um on record, most of all. And then we'll figure out the live <laughs> the live thing later on when it comes time, you know. Um it's yeah. Usually I start working on a song and I'm like, I know it won't be two or till two or three years or whatever until this is done live. So we'll we'll cross that bridge. That's a when problem. it comes to it. Yeah, it's a problem for future me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I feel that. Usually for us, it's a problem for our future drummer. You yeah. Know, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most yeah. of my drum parts are just like D beats and thrash, like kind yeah. of thing. So, uh, and you do have a fantastic yeah. drummer. Oh, as yeah. well. He's he, really good. Uh, Max is yeah. more than capable of anything I throw at him. He usually, usually we just give him like free reign. We're like, here's the song. Just do what you want over, like, uh, does he record them as well no uh, all right so still, you still record everything yourself yeah, it's still done yeah just at home it's too much logistic logistical and mm. expense you know uh studios and time and stuff and the main reason for me is i like to change things so so often 
you know so if you you know you record the drums at like a studio or whatever two mm-hmm. years it could be like two years or something i'll have the drums done for a song before i get near the end of recording and for example yeah the last album again um i had it all recorded i basically had the submission date with the label you know i, I was like it'll be with you in like two weeks or whatever so we were getting things planned and then i decided i wasn't happy with the song and i quickly deleted that song and recorded a new one and if i if i had to go and hire a studio and do all that kind of stuff that wouldn't it'd be you could make it work but it'd be very difficult very well for me anyway um it'd be difficult Mm. and it'd be a lot of hassle but for me yeah it was just quickly change things um and then record it in a couple of weeks which is yeah which that's impressive by the way oh thank you yeah i mean it doesn't often happen usually the songs take so long but occasionally there's like one song per album where things just kind of flow and i usually in it and it's and it's kind of written very quickly but the rest of the songs take take me so long um again i think it's because of the i'm trying to hold myself to a higher standard you know with every album Mm, Um, of course i'm trying to kind of do something new um with with each song you know i'm as I, I guess, especially with like the production, and I guess over the years I've become better as an uh, a musician. So I'm kind of able to try different things now, you know, like um, like just production wise, for example, I can you know try all these different techniques or whatever I don't know. Whereas before it was like the, when I first the first couple of releases and stuff, it was I had no idea what I was doing. I'm I wasn't the best at guitar whatever so it was just kind of one track each side um no real effects on anything you know no real i mean the first ep wasn't even mastered i didn't even know what mastering was <laughs> sure so it was kind of like that kind of stuff like i was very limited in that respect which i guess could have been an advantage in some way um but yeah as i improve and stuff i want to try different things i want to Um, bring different elements into the music and kind of challenge myself as well at the same time you know just taking inspiration from elsewhere you know if i'm listening to i don't know say alice in chains or the beatles or manic street preachers or something you know and i'm like oh how could i incorporate this into black metal it's not always the easiest you know (laughs) try to get something from an outside source into Mm what you do um, yeah but and- it's also again something that's been done so much especially within black metal you know i mean black metal i would go as far as saying that ironically enough in 2024 if you look at the back catalog of black metal that exists musically speaking it's arguably the most diverse musical yeah. genre that's ever existed Absolutely. i would say there's so, yeah there's so much like yeah um, I think I've had this conversation with someone a couple of days ago as well. It's just such a a genre that um, lends itself well to whatever kind of descriptor you want to put in front of it. You know, like symphonic and atmospheric, and then and then black post, and, and then and then yeah. black and death, and then shoegaze, black thrash, black speed. Yeah. You know, it's just like yeah. and then somehow within, yeah. And then within yeah. those genres, you've got kind of you know. Um, like the black speed you've got the kind of more brutal thrashy stuff kind of influenced by like creator or uh early creator and merciless and stuff i don't know and uh, then you've got the other side like the the midnight side like the black and roll venom um whatever um so that's just like one one genre there that's got like many influence like many uh sub 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 genres or whatever you want to say mm-hmm. But I guess that's pro- also part of that is because I think black metal is just kind of, you know, everyone always looks at thrash metal as kind of like the second bit of heavy metal. But I think it's black metal is is like very close. It's just like a really, it's like a layer that's, it's like a cancerous layer that's like attached to heavy metal. Because if you think of 
when it started and the things that kind of started it. You know, you even think of the first Sepultura EP, you think of the first Morbid Angel EP, you know, you think of all of this stuff that already came out in the 80s, which as far as I'm concerned, or all the Brazilian bands, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, whether it was uh, like that, uh, that, uh, what was it the uh, the four way split on on uh, with the sarcophago and chuckle and all those bands you know that came out in what like 1986 87 yeah. i get the thrash metal was already a thing by then but still in the great map of things when you look at hellhammer you look at bathory you look at uh, venom obviously yeah. you know it's kind of like black metal was kind of yeah. almost always already there you know it's just that they kind of got to kind of grab some shovels and dig a little bit deeper into it yeah. with like then morbid and then and then mayhem and you know of, yeah. of course all those bands that kind of came afterwards yeah. uh, so i guess it's a bigger part of metal than perhaps we also like to give it credit for mm. i suppose is what i'm yeah. trying to say yeah i guess yeah i guess it's uh what your what your definition of like black metal is you know everyone has the different uh like you know like who was the first band and stuff but yeah i think yeah black metal i guess like yeah the bands that you're saying there like venom and hellhammer and uh merciful fate who i would consider to be a first uh first 100 it's basically Absolutely. they're basically just a mixture of thrash and heavy metal at the at the time mm -hmm. i guess um because yeah venom get kind of lumped in both the the new wave of british heavy metal and black metal um kind of style um yeah yeah i think yeah i know what you're saying yeah 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 so i think it's it's i don't know it's just a powerful genre but i also you know i guess maybe ad nauseum for everyone listening to eblis manifestations but i think it's uh, more of a way of thought and a way of life than uh simply just what the music yeah. sounds like you know you, yeah. you don't need to i don't think you need to just have like minor chords to make it black mm -hmm. metal you know yeah yeah, it's a, it's a thing that I mean I'm not the best at, yeah, like describing or paying attention and stuff. So I think it's like a, when I when when I hear something, I'm like that's black metal, you know. Mm. I couldn't describe why, you know, because it, it uh, yeah. I mean, I would still say like for example, like yeah, Dark Thrones, uh, punk era. I would still kind of class that as black metal sure like sure yeah uh, like the especially the um uh what do you call it the the cult is alive kind of thing that's a bit more primitive mm -hmm. sounding than the the couple ones that followed but i mean that's not transylvania hunger it's come it's not it's not the same at all but it's uh but the thing is even those first four albums they sound nothing like each other yeah yeah exactly yeah and it's not just them, but it's pretty much every one of those uh, second wave of, uh, you know, like the, the Norwegian wave that, mm -hmm. that happened with black metal. Uh, this I always said this, is that when someone makes you think about black metal, you kind of go towards, okay, corpse paint, and maybe sound-wise you're thinking something along the lines of Transylvanian hunger. That's generally yeah. what people imagine when, yeah. when you mention the genre, you know. Uh, but then really when you think about it, with Mayhem, obviously, first of all, you had Death Crush, which is just its own absolute, you know, like it's like a phenomenon with it music, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. It's such a weird, strange, but fascinating release. And then you've got The Mysteries, which is just kind of like, I guess, that's more of a blueprint. But then you've got the first two Emperor albums. They don't sound alike each other. Mm -hmm. They didn't sound like anything else that came out. Mm -hmm. The same goes for Immortal. They didn't sound, the, the albums didn't sound like each other and didn't sound like anything else that came out at the time. Dark yeah. Throne, first four, five records, they sound nothing like each other and don't sound yeah. like anything else that came out at the time. So, you know, I guess Burzum was a little bit more consistent in his style, but even yeah. then it didn't really sound like much else that was coming out at the time mm -hmm. either. So there is this very weird thing, you know, that there it's just kind of, it's this thing that exists between the lines rather than there being like a very specific sort of... Um, yeah formula to to make it happen more so than i think maybe people realize you know um yeah 
Yeah, I think when people were trying to imitate the genre, or I guess still do, I don't know what people do with this now, but uh, I guess when they were trying to imitate it, they were imitating something that existed in between the lines rather than one band in particular. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And I mean, yeah, and then over the years as well, I mean, you know, you say something about black metal and everyone's like, oh, horrible production, headset, microphone, whatever. Yeah. But, but then most black metal, you know, like getting later in the 90s and stuff was much better recorded and mm -hmm. it's still black metal. Like for something that the production is such a big um, part of the style, it's evolved to where yeah. it's now you've got black metal that sounds cleaner than like pop music <laughs> i oh well you 100 do you know yeah. actually i will say though the the fact that a lot of suppose i i guess quote unquote outsiders always say that oh that's their impression of black metal you see this in like festival comments you know in like forums mm -hmm. or like threads you know where you know especially festivals that don't specifically cater to an extreme metal audience when people say oh we want to see black metal bands there's always someone who comes and says oh no one wants to hear a band with bad production whatever and i, I gotta yeah. say man that always just rustles my jimmies because yeah. i think you know like there, there's so much more to the fucking genre than that you know and it sometimes it doesn't affect my approach and what i'm doing but it almost makes me think I'm not sure if this is what I want to be associated with because I always take pride in having high quality music, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and uh, high quality. At, I'm not talking about the songwriting. That's for people to say, but at least as far as production is concerned, I've got high standards, you know, so I want my music to sound a certain way. Uh, yeah. And then because it suits the style of songwriting yeah. that we do, you know, and if I wanted to create something that's more noisy and fucking horrible, then I'll do that. But both are still equally black metal as one yeah. another because of the intent and kind of what forms it so mm -hmm. yeah there is that little bit of a wall that just kind of fucking annoys me sometimes you know i bet if you went around saying hell ripper is only a black metal band people would probably have preconceived notions that would be aiming far beneath what your band's actually yeah. capable of yeah i mean it's the same you see it with every um every style you know it's like oh this band plays thrash metal and it's like oh i hate singing songs about pizza and you know they just associate <laughs> that you know or, yeah, yeah or same with death metal it's like oh kooky monster vocals non-intelligible lyrics music whatever and i'm like I, I mean i guess that's the kind of that's just the kind of stereotype but i mean yeah within all those genres you know i mean would you say like mega death <laughs> or mm. a thrash band or i don't know someone like opeth sound like cannibal corpse and sound like morbid angel <laughs> like you know um, yeah. there's, just, there's it's just i guess if you're not if you're not into it and you're not and you don't pay attention and you don't know the the different kinds you're not interested you know like i guess you wouldn't know the the difference between like those bands i mentioned i know i guess you wouldn't understand the or care about the mm. the fact that they've got different sounds. I guess the people that kind of say that it's just they have no interest in black metal or whatever. So all of it is just bad produced, and I don't want to hear black metal. Like they they're just not a fan of black metal, I guess, and they don't and they haven't explored it. So and i bet if you gave yeah. them a black metal band and gave it a different name, they'll probably buy it. They'd be like, oh, this <laughs> sounds great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it, there's too many different things. I mean, even like someone like uh, first one that comes to mind is like Death Heaven, you know, like mm. a band that are more, let's say, accessible. You know, they're, you know, bringing like the different elements that are a bit um, less '90s black metal into their uh, into their music, and it it's more palatable, I guess, to your average listener than yeah death crush or something i don't know <laughs> sure um, the, yeah. the, speaking of death heaven it, it's totally given me the idea now to start a new anti-post black metal project called <laughs> blind hell and i think uh yeah 
I'd, I'd like for one of the listeners of the podcast to get in touch and start this project <laughs> immediately. Or, or you and I can do it. <laughs> I think they just signed the Roadrunner. I think I cool. saw that. I think good so. for them. Good for yeah. them. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the band, but you know, good for them. That's awesome. Yeah. I hope I hope it serves them well. Um, yeah. James, just to kind of like uh, wrap things up here, man, uh, you know, kind of just coming back into Hell Ripper. Um, what's the ultimate goal of the band? What's the uh, what is it that uh, you're trying to achieve or at least you're hoping to achieve or a particular stage or whatever it is, if you want to unpack that for us? I mean, I think I probably said the exact same on the last time we did this. It's just to keep enjoying writing music, keep keep writing music and releasing music is the ultimate goal for me. The um, Of course, I want the band to grow, but not at the the detriment of the music. So I want to, mm. yeah, my goal is to write music that pleases myself first and foremost, and then hopefully the growth will come with that um yeah i mean it's crazy we've played with a bunch of my favorite bands and stuff um which, which was would be unthinkable a few years ago for me you know so it's like you know a band like toxic holocaust bands like midnight warbringer you know that we've played with so it's um yeah for me the I write the music and the rest kind of falls into place if it's good enough, if you know what I mean. Um, I know there's a lot of other parts to it, but I just want to write music, do the the bit that surrounds it, you know, try and get out there and then hopefully, yeah, play with more bands that I'm a fan of and play different, more countries, different countries. And um, yeah, I mean... I mentioned the expectations were 10 people would hear Hell Ripper and maybe like it. Mm. And so kind of everything above that has been a mm. bonus and has been beyond what I could have um, wished, you know. Um, and yeah, I'm happy. Thing, things are going well. I'm not complaining whatsoever. And yeah, we're busy this year with touring and we'll see what comes with that and then working on the ne the new album and yeah, just seeing what happens really is what it's basically what I do. I kind of just <laughs> see what happens. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome, man. And long may it continue for you. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely, uh, real James, brother. This was a real fun conversation, man. Yeah, real man. pleasure to I've have you back it. on the podcast. I've enjoyed it, man. Nice speaking to you again. And yeah, I mean, last time we spoke, you sent me the Tribax album. And then it was released, yeah, like what, six months later or whatever. Mm. And yeah, you spoke before. Yeah, so I guess it, it's only been a year or something since we spoke, but there's been a lot. <laughs> a the, lot's happened since, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, we, we released the album in September, but yeah. we put it we put out the video in July, which has had the yeah, that was somewhat getting, of... Uh, yeah, was yeah. So much views and so much, uh, like, like viral i guess if you want to i think you could say that i i i really feel cringe saying it this way but the reality of the matter is that it had more than the new videos by marduk and mayhem which i'm not making a comparison here They're, those bands are literally like they are our, our gods we look up to them but it's a very strange fucking feeling to to see that um and and it's a video i i fully stand by you know and yeah. uh, they used it at the protest they, they used it as a protest against the uh, iranian government outside the iranian embassy oh, yeah. in frankfurt like wow. two weeks after the video came out which was the fucking weirdest thing i've ever seen Crazy. and what's cool is that the people who did that who by the way i would have never told them oh you should go and do this i had no idea i didn't even really know them you know i just mm -hmm. you know sort of vaguely recognize them as being supporters of trivex but those same people who did that and obviously they they fucking got my attention when they did that kind of thing yeah. the same people have now invited us to go and 
play the this uh, festival in uh, Hanau in Germany which is i guess near uh, quite near Fra- Frankfurt by like maybe yeah. like 20 30 miles or something and uh, they're like yeah you guys come and headline this festival you know, which i'm like <laughs> you yeah. know That's it's so cool. uh, it's it's very co- listen man you know i i know it sounds like I'm, i'm i'm acting a little bit silly here but it's just because it's fucking overwhelming you know it's just really yeah. crazy but on the other hand you know it makes perfect sense you know that's that's what we are here to do after all that, yeah. that is our message you know there's only so much that you need to pinch yourself before you turn around and say you know what actually this feels right and if anyone's gonna do it it's us you know mm-hmm. so uh, i'm sure you probably get that as well but uh <laughs> but yeah man things are uh things are pointing uh pointed in the right direction you know it's yeah, uh it's all about the journey anyways is that miley cyrus meme keeps saying but yeah uh, yeah <laughs> but yeah man listen brother absolutely uh, a pleasure to have you on you know um and uh all the very best for hell repair keep on doing what you're doing uh i'm super fucking happy for you guys to see the way that the band is growing and i only hope to see more of that and i'm sure that we will and uh and yeah you know i love the attitude i love the the groundedness of it all and i love the you know the no focus on bullshit you know I, i wish i was a little bit more like that but I am, you know, I'm a bullshit magnet sometimes, so I, I can't help it. But uh, yeah, man, all the best to you guys. And very much looking forward to sharing the stage with you in yeah, Italy, Italy later yeah, this man. year. All right. Yeah. And keep on kicking ass. Cheers, um, man. You too. Fuck yeah. And to everyone else listening to the podcast, hope you guys enjoyed this one. Be sure to support the fuck out of Hell Ripper if you don't already. And we'll see you on the next episode of Iblis Manifestations.